Okay, good to uh, be here. Good evening to everybody. My name is um, Tim Hughes. I'm a um, professor of English at Brown and I convene the film Thinking series. Uh, welcome. Um, this is, uh, we've just been watching uh, Sacrificed Youth from 86. And um, uh, I want to, um, it's, a, it's been a special um, screening. As a matter of fact, we we um, we had some um, um, we made some efforts to get hold of this print of the film, uh, and in fact, um, Ling Zhen Wang on my right uh, was instrumental in, in us being able to get hold of a copy. We 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 did certain work, a certain amount of work with Ben Safran from the Kogut Institute, who appended new subtitles to the film. So you have been watching a fairly unique, well, a unique uh, uh, print of this film. Um, with all its gorgeous uh, colour, so we'll we'll talk about all of this. So, thanks to uh, thanks to you for coming. Thanks to the Kogut Institute for hosting us. Thanks to the Kogut staff, uh, Gregory Kimbrell and Rachel Alm are, are staffing this event, as is Ben Safran. So you will see them um, around. Um, let me introduce our guests. Um, first of all, Ling Zhen Wang is uh, professor of East Asian Studies at Brown and a long term long long time uh, colleague. And it was Ling Zhen who suggested this uh, work for um, a film thinking event quite a long time ago. So I'm delighted it's come to um, pass. Um, and Ling Zhen has written on it or edited numerous books on Chinese cinema with a special interest on work by women directors. Her most recent book is titled Revisiting Women's Cinema, Feminism, Socialism and Mainstream Culture in Modern China which was published by Duke University Press in 2021. She's also the author of the short extract um, that you have on your handout, which is from Ling Zhen's essay, partly on sacrificed youth in, in, that was published in Camera Obscura in 2019. So please take a copy of that on your way out if you, if you don't have one um, uh, yet. Um, Cassandra Guan uh, uh, is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow seated on Ling Zhen's right. Um, uh, affiliated with the Center for Art, Science and Technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So um, she works at the intersection of screen media studies and the history and theory of the life sciences. She has a book in progress called, um, well, I, this is the title that I found that it is called, maybe it's changed, Maladaptive Media, Life and Other Works of Animation, which reimagines animation practices through the concept of work. Uh, in a global context and from a materialist perspective. And that concept of work, um, I imagine, is, is playing into some of your thinking around, uh, around this film. Um, Cassandra is also a, a, a doctoral graduate from Brown's uh, program in modern culture and media. And then, um, finally, um, um, Wang Lu is a, a pianist and composer. She's also an associate professor of music at Brown, and she's currently a Virginia B. Toolmin Foundation Fellow at the Center for Ballet and the Arts at New York University. Her awards and accolades are too numerous to list in full, but they include a 2014 Guggenheim Fellowship, the Berlin Prize in Music Composition in spring 2019, and many, many compositional works for music ensembles, including the Ensemble Moderne, uh, Ensemble and Contemporain, uh, Ensemble Recherche, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra Music Now, uh, Minnesota Orchestra, the Boston Lyric Opera, American Composers Orchestra, the Orchestre, Orchestre National de Lille, uh, all, uh, the Holland Symphonia, Symphonia uh, the Shanghai National Chinese Orchestra, the Taipei Chinese Orchestra, Alarm Will Sound, and really many, many others. Her compositional work is, is influenced by environmental sounds, uh, especially urban and rural and, and um, traditional Chinese music, but she also works a lot with improvisation and with distinctively contemporary instrumental techniques, all of which is highly relevant to the extremely innovative music uh, in, um, in, the work, in the film that we've just been um, watching. So we can't wait to hear your uh, insights into that. So um, what I'd like to do first is to ask Ling Zhen to talk about why, or, or not, not necessarily why this film is important, to her. Uh, she's written about it uh, at, at, in a lot of detail, but, um, but also maybe the, you know, the ways in which it is, what, what are the ways in which the film is important to you? 
Um, how should we understand, I mean, I have many questions um, really coming out of my ignorance, but how should we understand the place of this film in the trajectory of post-revolutionary or post-Mao uh, Chinese cinema? You know, where does it fit in, in, that, in that kind of um, post-Mao um, story um, of, um, of cinema? It's often talked about as a Chinese new wave film. We talked about it in those terms when we first started talking about it. Um, and I think that that would also be, uh, you know, an interesting um, conversation to, to have. Um, what have been the um, innovations of this film formally, and what has been their importance not only in the moment it was made, but it, it, it's sort of some, its importance since since the film was made. So, in a way, what has been its influence? Um, uh, you know, so maybe you could, yeah, you could start. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me well? Um, it's a lot of questions, <laughs> so perhaps uh, at this point I'm going to just talk briefly about why perhaps I recommend this film, and uh, if we get time after you know the other two guests you know tune in, we can go back to more serious questions about you know where we should understand the film in the film history, Chinese yes. film history. Um, I think I'll uh, because uh, first of all, thank I would like to thank. Uh, Tim for organizing this event and also for <laughs> providing such a nice uh, a summary uh, of my arguments in the article. Uh, it, it captures the gist uh, of my, you know, major argument. So uh, because I, you know, already here, you know, you can, you can read a little bit. So I'm going to focus on why, you know, I choose uh, Zhang Lanxing. Um, I, I just give, give quickly two major reasons. Um, 90, uh, so in the West, when we talk about Chinese cinema, 1980s, 1990s, beyond, you know, uh, fifth generation filmmakers, right, we're familiar with, kind of familiar with, and then sixth uh, generation filmmakers, uh, exclusively, exclusively male film directors, right? So what really happened in 1980s China, right? There were about uh, over 30 female directors, all active uh, across at least three generations um, uh, for just within a decade, 1980s, 1990s, they produced over 100 films. This is a world record <laughs> uh, which has endured right until today, right? Um, so uh, obviously it shows, you know, a, a very gendered reception here, right? Especially in, I think, perhaps also in um, uh, American academia, right? Um, but then beyond gender, I think there are other reasons, for example, why fifth generation filmmakers, sixth generation film, uh, filmmakers are so popular. I think um, their films can fit more nicely or neatly into the categories we have here, the, the art house cinema, right? Um, and then recently, slow movies or slow cinema, right? So uh, uh, for those who watched, you know, Jia Zhang Ke's film, for example, Sixth Generation, and for Fifth Generations, you know, Chen Kai Ge and Chen Kai Ge, Yellow Earth, which is the signature film of the fifth generation, came out the same year with, you know, the uh, 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 Sacrifice Youth came out, right? Um, so my idea of introducing this film um, to this wonderful, you know, Kugut uh, 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 film thinking event is to introduce audience right to Chinese women cinema right, which uh, not only produced by many you know women directors there and their films uh, when they first came out very influential right. So at least we can have a glimpse you know of uh, uh, filmmakers' films right. So that's the uh, uh, first reason and second reason. Zhang Nuanxing, the director, is not just a one female director. Uh, she's very very important. Uh, uh, she was a, uh, a pioneering figure in Chinese new cinema in 1980s. Right? That's a big deal. New cinema nowadays, when we talk about Chinese new cinema, represented exclusively by fifth generation uh, male directors. But she was, in fact, uh, the pioneering figure before right, fifth generation uh, filmmakers. She was uh, uh, pioneering not just in uh, Filmmaking, but also in theory, right? She uh, co-authored an article called "I Think Modernization of Chinese Film 
Modernization of film language uh, in China, considered as the manifesto of you know, Chinese artistic as experiment in cinema at the time. Uh, people argue that it you know, mapped out you know, the blueprint for you know, the uh, Chinese new cinema. Um, uh, in this article, she also introduced the French new wave, Italian you know, uh, new realism to China, Bazin's long take, so on and so forth. Right? So she was really a, um, a, a, a spear, you know, spearheading you know, figure. Uh, and of course, she also applied, not apply. I think she would, she also, um, uh, uh, she also belonged to the first group using um, uh, all those, you know, uh, uh, stylistic, you know, features associated with new, you know, uh, realism and French New Wave, on location shooting, you know, natural lighting, you know, sound recording. Uh, and of course, she also uh, uh, revised, in a way, French New Wave, you know, um, um, for this film we're watching, uh, she also incorporated the, the original author's, you know, stream of consciousness directly into, you know, uh, this film. So you have this, you know, uh, subjective uh, voice over, female voice over. So she created, you know, something I would call documentary subjective cinema. Uh, so documentary itself is already very experimental after the Cultural Revolution, which very much featured you know, political melodrama, right? So in this film, you can tell you know, uh, uh, the so-called you know, the ordinary everydayness evoked right? with you know, relatively you know, long, you know, long takes, and especially on location shooting, non-professional uh, actors, you know, uh, actresses, you know, so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, so she's not just a, a regular one, but then when I talk about uh, Zhang Nanxing, very often um, I am reminded of Agnes Varda, mm. right, in French New Wave, who also pioneered, you know, certain uh, very much, you know, French New Wave styles, uh, yet became very much marginalized, right, in the later part, you know, when, you know, New Wave became really, you know, uh, a trend. Um, the same thing happened to Zhang Nanxing, right? Very important filmmaker. Uh, 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 she belonged to fourth generation in Chinese filmmaking. Uh, but then she was marginalized when, you know, the uh, fifth generation uh, male film uh, 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 directors became known uh, in the world. Uh, but what, what I want to emphasize that gender is only one factor, right? The other, perhaps more important, uh, factor or reason for her uh, marginalization is the vision, is the ideas, right? Uh, uh, I think it's her uh, uh, critical revision on cultural evolution as well as, like this was, you know, uh, this film came out in 1985, you know, six. That was mid 1980s, right? Was the time when new mainstream discourse formed. New mainstream dis discourse. Uh, uh, liberal, liberal, more individual oriented, you know, uh, discourse uh, in more in favor of, you know, the uh, universal, you know, aesthetic values, for example, detached kind of, you know, uh, 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 elitist, you know, reflection, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, this film came out, you know, at that moment when China, the cultural, you know, the cultural scene turned, you know, even more toward a liberal, uh, oriented direction. That's the new mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but then this film, obviously, um, highly anticipated, right? But then the reception is very split because this film does not directly endorse uh, that kind of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, detached uh, aesthetic value or reflection, critical, you know, uh, uh, masculine, you know, uh, uh, re reflexivity, uh, and also uh, uh, different from uh, the other uh, other emerging mainstream discourse, like you know, a sexual difference, for example, uh, essential female consciousness, so on and so forth. So this film is itself is already very rich, you know, as we can tell. But behind <laughs> behind the film, uh, if we situate this film in the you know the broad mainstream transformation. So we can talk. We can talk a lot more. The significance uh, 
of this film. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's incredibly uh, helpful to give us some kind of sense. I mean, you've named the the sort of like the new wave elements in the film, the formal um, the formal um, innovations of the of this film, largely as mapped out in the in the uh, in the article that you mentioned, the modernization of film of film language. Look, look, can we try to sort of build uh, on what you said, really, Lieutenant, and think about the kind of uh, the sort of ideological component? You talked about the split response. You thought you talked about the way that the, the, the film. Um, doesn't exactly endorse um, one one particular mode that, or, than the other. So maybe we could sort of talk a bit more about this. Maybe I could um, also extend the conversation to Cassandra um, because so one of the things that I <clears throat> found, I, I just feel I also need more education over is is the stakes of this film in in and its relationship to the to the um, the, the period in particular of the Cultural Revolution. Um, because it, there seems to be a, um, you know, we have these characters who are being sent down from the um, city to this area. Now, I mean, to this rural area, which I take it is in the, in the Yunnan um, uh, province. Mm -hmm. What is going on there? Can we sort of maybe contextualize that a bit? Maybe, maybe Cassandra, would you like to talk a bit, a bit about that? Or, um, or Lingjia, would you like to also, also give us, give us Why more? Why wouldn't that? you go ahead and uh, I can, you know, fill in? Well, it, um, I, maybe, maybe I will begin by just making a few points, the really observations that I made while watching the film um, that may not be immediately obvious unless you're very familiar with the cultural context of the kind of sent down, um, uh, up the mountain, down to the countryside movement. Um, one thing to be noted is that the vast majority of teenagers, uh, even though they were known as these uh, like knowledge youth, but you know, none of them, really very few of them had more than secondary um, uh, school, uh, schooling at this point, um, the vast majority of them were um, kind of sent to, um, you know, the countryside, not at such a great distance from their original kind of urban origin as, you know, the movement of the main character, um, Li Chun, from Beijing all the way to the Burmese borders of like the Yunnan province. Um, and my understanding is that um, there were um, there are two ways you can get sent down. One of them is that you're group organized, and there are also exceptional cases where people can kind of volunteer and choose to go somewhere. And one of the situations, and I think the film is obliquely hinting that this is a case with the protagonist, is that there's a um, political issue. You know, she mentions that she didn't apply for college the first time the opportunity came around because of her family background. Um, and then also the fact that at the very beginning, you may recall, um, you know, she mentions in this internal monologue that her father um, was sent, you know, to some type of uh, re-education, like um, labor, la uh, 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 work in the countryside. And that would not be typical, you know, he would not be a part of this uh, age group to be sent down. And that suggests that she is the uh, daughter of, you know, uh, a family, you know, with uh, within the kind of like uh, communist uh, revolutionary uh, uh, governmental class um, that has fallen into disfavor, um, and there may be a special reason for her to have been, you know, sent to where she was in the film. So there's, you know, it's not very clear, but there's uh, this kind of indication that she may have some sort of special um, relationship to the, uh, you know, history of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and that it's not one of the um, kind of uh, average um, sent down use in the film. So I, I don't know if Ligia would agree with this reading. Their uh, uh, family background, uh, uh, intellectuals, like um, I think it's teachers. Um, so that's also indication because, you know, the cultural revolution, one of the two targets, intellectuals. Yes. Right, so, um, so yeah, their parents, I think, you know, uh, those belong to yes. yes. Yes, okay. Um, <clears throat> what about, I mean, why, <clears throat> I mean, there's also the question of, I mean, this is also almost an ethnographic film, isn't it? We have um, the um, Dai community here, whose language is not translated for the most part, right? Yeah. It's not subtitled. Um, so the perspective of the film <clears throat> continues to be, if I'm, if I'm reading the film correctly, continues to be the Mandarin-speaking Han characters are, are kind of the, uh, remain the, the point of view for a lot, a lot of the film. Um, and there's a lot of conversation around 
around um, intellectual matters. One of them reads Rousseau, the other one does not. So there's, there's, there are things to kind of unpack here. And then we have these extraordinary scenes of, um, of depiction of a, of, a, of, a, of a community that is a minority community, um, in fact, heavily minority community, and a, and a rural and provincial community. So maybe, what, what, do, you, what do you guys make of that um, dimension of the film? Um, um, where do you sort of put, is there a kind of ideological dimension to that or that, that, you, that you think is important? Um, yeah, I was uh, hoping to say something about the ethnographic dimension of the film and put it into the context of a kind of uh, revival of the ethnographic imagination in the 1980s. And there were several strands of this revival. Um, even at the level of um, film culture. So if you uh, remember, this is a decade when uh, Red China kind of opened its door to foreign documentarians and filmmakers, uh, people like Bertolucci and the German experimental filmmaker Ulrika Altinger um, to come in and make you know, ethnographic or pseudo-ethnographic films. So there's a kind of um, external ethnographic gaze um, on the minority cultures, or sometimes just um, <coughs> quote unquote traditional cultures of the country, um, and, and, and then you know, all kinds of um, critical responses to that, both internal and external. Um, and then the uh, uh, kind of internal celebration, um, re, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, reappraisal mm -hmm. of um, the cultures of the ethnic minorities, um, you know, happening in, in the works of both the force generation and film, fifth generation filmmakers, um, many of the kind of uh, classic, um, you know, uh, 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 widely received internationally celebrated films of fifth generation filmmakers like Yellow Earth, um, the second film that Chen Kai Ge made, um, one year after Sacrifice Youth, King of the Children, which is a very similar story, but a kind of male version of a sent down youth in Yunnan once again, um, and a, a kind of existential drama of this alienated modern Han subjectivity before the broadly, um, primarily visual spectacle of this kind of cultural difference. Um, and about that cultural difference, I want to just say that, you know, the uh, there's a very specific kind of understanding of ethnicity, of ethnic minority in the Chinese context, and it's a system that's kind of um, inherited from the Soviets, you know, the categorization, the taxonomy mm -hmm. of the national minorities that doesn't really correspond to, um, you know, as to, to, to anthropological and linguistic groupings, the so-called Dai community, where people actually encompass a number of um, uh, ethnic groups with like, you know, Northern Thai affiliation, and then they're just kind of broadly and unilaterally categorized as a single ethnicity and treated as such in the film. There's never really any kind of differentiation. Um, and, um, um, and, and then also to say that Yunnan, the province, um, has a very specific status in the Han Chinese kind of ethnographic imagination insofar as that it's, it's uh, uh, you know, as ethnically diverse, um, but also there's a kind of benevolent representation of the kind of um, South East Asian minorities um, in comparison to, say, uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or the, uh, the, the, the Mongolians. Um, uh, and so there's, uh, um, uh, you know, eventually, before long, in fact, Yunnan would become a tourist destination, internal tourist destination, right? And already in the 80s, like mm -hmm. when Eureka Ottinger made her first documentary film in China in 1985, one year before Sacrifice Use, a film called China, the Arts, the People, you know, she was sort of guided by the state. The film begins in Beijing and ends in Yunnan in like a bi community. And so there's a kind of exoticization of Yunnan and the minorities in Yunnan, and you see this um, in different types of films and you know, eventually like becoming a part of popular culture, this kind of fantasy of this um, sort of tropical, like abundant, sexually liberated um, kind of uh, 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 you know, set of cultural practices. And I feel like um, you see the premonition of that already in this film. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it, it leads us, I think, on at least partly to the 
kind of very sensuous uh, dimensions of, the, of this film. Of course, it's a film that is steeped in color, an extraordinary use of color, um, a, a use of sound, <clears throat> a sound and noise. And then, of course, also of music. And a lot of the music is, seems to be um, um, situated in this precise regional, it's regional and, and maybe cultural. Um, so maybe I, uh, maybe I could also turn to you, um, Wang Lu, and um, ask you for your kind of perspective on this film as, a, uh, as somebody who is also a kind of um, deeply practicing um, musician, composer, um, somebody who works with some of the traditional um, um, uh, musics that we uh, encounter. What is your, uh, what is your um, angle, uh, uh, Lu, on the on this uh, dimension of the film? Um, you know, I would ask the audience to recall what you remember musically from the film first. What are the moments you still have a recollection at this moment? And what was the first time you noticed there was music? Um, as a composer myself, when I see a film like this, I just ask a question. Where should I write the music? Okay, so when such as you all discussed, um, this is a particular culture that's complex and a particular time. And it's almost like a paradise away for those sent down youth from, you know, what kind of music's being played around that time. Is the model operas, mm -hmm. uh, the Beijing opera, the ballet, and etc. even uh, for cultural, preservation, musical preservation purpose in different regions, like the Uyghur region, for instance, or like Northwest Chinese, where I'm from, or the Canton region, the cultural, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, in order to preserve their own local opera, um, they would have to make adaptation of model operas. So musically, think about if a composer has to compose, I almost feel like you don't compose. And as the best result of the film is, most of the sound you hear are diegetic, or have the effect of a diegetic nature. If you recall the very beginning, before anything happened, it's the sound of a very mellow, harmonious, resonating gong. That's consistent. And the resonance of that just glows. On top of that, you have drums come in, you know. You think about gong and bell sounds, it really evoke a distance. It just tells you something is distant, but also could be in terms of time. If you're retrieving a memory not from image, not from conversation, but from sound. Sometimes we do that through sense, you know, or smell, you know, or touch, and that's very clear is from sound. And when the drums come in, there's no uh, resolution or directionality. It's a layer laid on top, faster. And both layers are circular. And then if you recall, there's a hulu si, so kind of like a gourd-shaped instrument play. Also a circular modal, I'm talking about music theory now, modal <laughs> set of pitches that has this la la, also have the chai tone, la 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 la. It's kind of like you could interpret that folk, but it could evoke folk music without being authentic, okay? Knowing the composer's style. Then you have um, the narrative. So the narrative comes in as part of musical texture. It's so poetic. Um, it's just fade in. You're, you're entering a different space through sound. And I noted, if maybe you noticed too, the really non-diegetic music is trying to be as discreet as possible. And the first time when it appeared, it's very brief. It's kind of a typical 1980s MIDI synthesizer sound, where the main protagonist, Jie Ru, finally realized that she can show her beauty, right? So the image of dragonfly landing on the pink lotus flower, there is a major pentatonic moment of about under 10 seconds of a sound. This sound you could also understand as the timbre quality of the gong from before, but layered. And then quickly it's gone. The second time when this kind of non-diegetic composed music coming, it's the same timbre 
appeared, I find it very interesting because she mentioned Cinderella and the shoes. But in music didn't really take place when she actually showed the dye dress she put on in front of the old grandma. That moment was silent, was when she was accepted by the group. You see the beautiful, colorful, you know, a dress worn by the dye young girls in the group, though this kind of synthesized music comes back again. Um, it's really fascinating. But most of the time, what you hear is, is nature sound, right? You hear birds, you hear cicada, you hear different insects. The first night when she was there, remember? There was girls and boys singing love songs to each other in the back. So there's a lot of music at night. There's a lot of night music, but it's not composed. It's, it's just part of the environment. Also, you feel like you probably, after this film, you're like dripping with water. It's a lot of water sound, amplification of the water, right? The rain and the footsteps, the wet footsteps and the wood sound, and also like the bat making noise at night. Um, another moment I think very interesting is towards the end when she returned, if you recall, that to attend the old grandma Ya's funeral. That's the first time the kind of diegetic funeral march music uh, with the gun that strikes faster than before, but it's the same as opening, opening sound laid on top of a MIDI synthesizer drone. Okay, so that's interesting. And other places, like there is a festival celebration scene where the drama escalated, it was also this a reflection of a temper, like character variation, I'll say, of the beginning, exactly the kind of instrument combined. And there's also another interesting is when you have silence, that you actually hear more of the environment. It's an invitation. You, you're like really with this one protagonist's voice. It's like only talking to you in your ears. It's the intimacy, I find it really brought it up. And it was amplified by the end when the color of the film turned from red, the warm color, the dream color, off when she went back to give the really tragic touch of the end of the story. Everything is very realistic, it's gray. And the landslide had removed everyone she knew you don't hear any nature sound. It's completely, there was water, but you don't hear water, okay? You only hear her wailing, weeping, right? That's really amplified with a lot of um, echoing. Um, Chu Xiaosong and Liu Solao were the composers. Chu Xiaosong and Liu Solao were both the first class of uh, composers admitted after Cultural Revolution in 1977 to the Beijing Central Conservatory. They are the pioneer of avant-garde uh, Chinese experimental music. In 1984, Qi Xiaosong composed a piece called Mengdong, where he, also like in the film, was one of the vocalists. Um, if you you know the style of his music, you understand. He composed in the style that sometimes it's hard to tell. If it's uh, composed or it's from the folk source. Um, uh, Liu Suola composed together with him, but also the song. If you remember the song, first time we heard uh, when the main protagonist was singing alone, right? In the, in the family, Dark and Night. And it's very hard to hear the beginning because you feel like there's no beginning. But you do, want, you do hear it's, it's diatonic and goes to a bright about sound and mom. In the end, the song was later played um, again by the uh, song again by the elementary school children and by the end like like the ending credit if you recall the song it goes like and then it goes ah It's just very diatonic, but it's fluid, and it flows. And it feels like a, a lullaby, you know? It feels like not composed. It feels like she just improvised. Of course, she's a uh, fantastic jazz vocalist, um, but this is not her like, 
uh, stage music uh, style. Um, so it's really fascinating. It's less about composed music, but mo more about overall sound um, design in a very immersive way. And heavily, I mean, almost all diegetic, as you were saying. That was a bonus, by the way, to get your lovely rendition of that uh, tune. Uh, thank you, Lou. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, so uh, thank you. That was that was that was uh, uh, wonderful. Um, I mean, the the, synth the synthesizer moments are the moments when the, suddenly the film seems dated, right? You suddenly think, oh, it is a nineteen eighties uh, uh, movie. Um, so um, um, the what about could, could, do, do you think we could maybe just talk just very briefly about the ideological elements of the of the film? And I, by that I mean um, the um, the ways in which. Um, um, for example, uh, Li Chan is is uh, is um, training to be. I mean, she's not training to be a doctor exactly, but she picks up some first aid knowledge, and um, and the film um, is very clear to to make the case that she cures the boy. Uh, it's not the um, it's not the folk um, uh, practices that that uh, that cure him. I mean, um, so th that that I think is kind of interesting. Um, there is an overall conversation going on about dye culture being essentially presented as uh, expressive, sensuous, exuberant, um, and then Han culture as being inhibited, withdrawn, intellectual. We have this, this theme brought out several times in the, in the conversations between the two um, Mandarin-speaking characters. Um, what is the film, do, do any of you have thoughts about what the film is trying to kind of do with that very clear opposition. Hmm. Um, thank you for the question. I think uh, the the differences between, say, cultures, whether it's Han and uh, Dai uh, uh, culture. Uh, uh, by the way, this is uh, the film is based on a autobiographical uh, woman, uh, a female a woman's uh, autobiographical uh, uh, short novel. Um, I think the, uh, for example, the, the one thing you mentioned interesting is the uh, doctor, uh, because the, the film emphasizes, you know, the two of them, they choose different kind of books, right? One is um, Li Chun, uh, f uh, f fights very hard to get the last copy of, I think it's called what, um, um, a, a Ruru Doctor's Manual, yes. right? Very popular during the Cultural Revolution, uh -huh. especially among Sandal youth. Um, so the, the whole theme of Sandown Youth, there are many layered right, um, things around Sandown Youth. One being um, after the uh, two year uh, uh, cultural revolution, 1966 to 1968, um, uh, it became a little bit chaotic in major cities. Um, and then the, the, the party, the government, uh, decided to restore the order. Uh, and the other thing is that through the Cultural Revolution, you know, the leader at that time also thought, you know, Chinese youth, in fact, was not up to the standard. Uh, so standard youth, the second half of this slogan is to get re-educated by peasants, right? So that's one thing. And the other thing is that you go to countryside, learn from peasants, understanding their work. You also go there to serve them, serve the people. That's a big, big thing in the socialist period, right? And then barefoot doctor became so important, right, among the, the Sandown youth. So Li Chun is typically follow, you know, that kind of um, uh, a trend, uh, going to the uh, uh, rural area. Um, and this one happened to be a minority mm. uh, ethnic group. Um, and then you, we can see, right, she gradually is integrated into the community, you know, even though this community is a, you know, minority uh, uh, community, right? So it's this integration uh, to a, a sense of, you know, shared, you know, value and life, everyday life. Um, I think, you know, the, she finds the second home, for example, in this style, you know, uh, 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 a community, uh, which also, in a way, fascinatingly echoes some socialist idea that real family, you know, family does not need to be, you know, blood related, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the, the high socialist period, of course, working class people, they form a bigger so-called family, right? And that is sometimes even more than, you know, the small private, you know, um, nuclear family, right? That's the uh, 
the, ideo the ideology there. So this film, in a way, uh, provides a revisit, revis revisited, I think, um, re revisionist, let's say, um, uh, uh, representation of cultural evolution. Right? There's a critique of it, you know, as dogmatic, as country, uh, 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 constraining, uh, is especially in terms of you know expression, of, you know, sexual desire, you know, the sense of beauty, so on and so forth. Uh, but then, interestingly, it also endorsed the other other aspects of you know the, the socialist period, right? Um, that is to you know to learn from, especially the, the working class people, uh, to uh, serve the people, uh, and fun fundamentally, I think. Um, the two protagonists represent um, two different ideologies, I would argue, right? So the other one, particularly, um, we don't know where you can get a copy of Rousseau's confession <laughs> during the late Cultural Revolution. I asked a lot of scholars, you know, yes. so what was the copy? Was there a copy there? They said, okay, perhaps, you know, there is a translation, say, before 1949, before Social China, right? Um, but nobody can locate, you know, what was that version? And then a friend from you know, Beijing Film Academy got a big picture of this uh, when they went, Li Chun, uh, uh, holds the book. You know. And then the title is, uh, is a book by Hegel. It's not Rousseau's oh. confession. <laughs> so my, my theory is that, you know, because this part is not following the original novel, so in the original novel, there's no this you know section on you know this um, you know uh, finding a, 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 a confession, a Rousseau's confession, and this is a, a new thing. Uh, Zhang Nanxing, you know, uh, added to uh, the film. Uh, so my argument is that creating a space for reflecting 1980s China, because Rousseau's confession was so popular in early 1980s. It's a big, big deal, right? Um, so in, you know, doing cultural evolution and in rural Yunnan, you know, I don't know, you know, nobody knew, I asked a lot of scholars, mm -hmm. you know. So I think, you know, uh, Zhang Nanxing tried to make a point, right? Um, so creating a space which was not in the original novel, uh, uh, her uh, uh, kind of a little bit, you know, uh, a commentary on uh, the rising new mainstream, you know, discourse. Uh, in 1980s uh, uh, China, it's definitely uh, liberal, individual oriented, you know. So here, you know, you have kind of, you know, different kind of ideologies represented by these two young people. And then in the film, uh, Ren Jia die, uh, in the story, Ren Jia dies a hero heroic death. Um, he sacrificed his own life and saving, you know, local people and their, you know, uh, uh, animals and so forth, right? But here, you don't have that. And here, before you know, the very ending, we definitely see there is a breakup between the two. That wasn't in the uh, a novel either, right? So there, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, Zhang Nanxin, very, very careful, even though it's very subtle, but you can see her kind of firm resistance to the rising new mainstream discourse that centers on, right, the market economy, mm -hmm. and associated with that, you know, the very detached, socially detached, you know, individualism. While Li Chun, right, despite Li Chun's critique of cultural revolution, you know, the, the uniformity, you know, like uh, you have to dress all the same, all those things she criticized with, but she never really turned against the social, social value as a totality, right? I to still carry on certain socialist ideals, right? Gender equality, you know, a social community, you know, the family beyond just you know, uh, blood-related, you know, families and so forth. Uh, so back to your question about <clears throat> the ideological significance. Mm. I guess that's you know why this film in the 1980s, even late 1980s and early 1990s, got a very interesting reception. Uh, some very individual-oriented feminist scholars, they were very disappointed because they didn't see the carry-through. They're very interested in the beauty, femininity, beauty scene. They think, you know, Zhang Nanjing should have carried it through, you know, forging a, a kind of a total break from, you know, uh, the collective thing or social-oriented thing, um, you know, promoting, you know, female essence, you know, or um, 
um, uh, individualistic you know, consciousness, uh, but Zhang Renxin did not do that. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So I think that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Cassandra? Yeah, um, I am going to accept um, Tim's invitation to um, do ideological analysis <laughs> <laughs> on the film. Um, and I, um, you know, I'm really like kind of, I, I was particularly struck by the comparative framework that the characters in the diegesis and the film as a level of film construction sets up over and over again between the so-called Dai culture and Han identity and culture. Um, and, you know, at this very moment, you have the construction of a comparative uh, epistemological project in the West, you know, institutionalized in fields like area studies um, yes. and in, uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of kind of um, Cold War um, type um, organizations <laughs> it's like the Peace Corps. Um, and, and here in a very different cult cultural context, you encounter the same kind of uh, structure of comparability. Um, with a very similar set of problematics. Like I keep on thinking back to like the critique of someone like Harry Haratunian um, of the comparative project. Um, and because, you know, again and again, the comparison between Han and Dai, ostensibly it's just between two different ethnicities and two different cultures, um, you know, where one is uh, sexually liberated, the other one is, you know, Protestant level repressed. Uh, and, you know, the kind of deafness of the, the Han people to music, to color, and then this kind of aesthetic, sensuous abundance of you know, the, the, the Dai people, their relationship with nature, um, and then the kind of scientific mindset, uh, philosophical and scientific mindset of the Han, it so closely approximates, approximates this kind of comparison between the modern and then a culture that's situated outside of the modern, whether it's the English in Italy or the Northern Italians in Southern Italy. Um, and so I think the time-space question becomes really important, where the time, the temporality of Dai culture is cyclical. It, you know, and then, and then this is why we're in the kind of realm of ethnography, from you know marriage, courtship to funeral and death. You get this kind of perennial cycle. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you know on the Han side, there's history happening. Um, there's a, a tractor churning, and I think it's very significant in the breakup scene that you know she says, "Let's go and talk in the house," and he stands by the tractor while it's still running. So there's a sense of movement. People, he, people are washed up by history, and there's a kind of call of history that they have to respond to. Um, and Dai culture stays in place. And then I think this is where I become very suspicious of the kind of subjectivity that the film you know, constructs um, and, and locks us into as spectators, pretty much at the level of the soundtrack, because of narration. Because uh, the, what is happening in the film, we see, we're exposed, we're immersed um, in this kind of audiovisual landscape. But then that's narrated, what's happening. And it's narrated in broadcasting standard Mandarin, you know, this kind of northern Mandarin that's been standardized just through radio and a film. Um, and that, that Mandarin speaks to the, 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 the spectator, the audience of the film. And that we are inevitably aligned with that perspective, yeah. you know, and that perspective is the perspective of the Han subject, of the modern subject, um, and, uh, uh, and and so ultimately, I think um, the film, um, you know, kind of puts the other culture on display. Like Dai becomes kind of uh, aligned with vision, with visual visual spectacle, and then the information, the narration happens on the side of the rational Han subject. Um, so I think there are, there are these um, kind of like structural problems with the film. Um, I mean, I can, I can go on, but I feel like yeah. I should, yeah. Well, well, I mean, I think we should pause for a moment because in fact, you, you, the three of you have given us uh, so much uh, to, to think about. And actually, I would like us to, you know, end really the evening with some, you know, the opportunity for people to, um, ask questions from the audience or make comments, responding either to the film or responding to anything that you've heard um, from us. So, so maybe, it, yes, if you, if, you would if you have something to say, you, you maybe do. Please wait for the microphone. So Ben, there is uh, uh, somebody here who would have something to say. So uh, thank you. Hi, I'm a political theory student and I, I, I love it, MCM. So I'm just gonna ask a political theory-ish question. Um, we understand that, that there's a lot of problematics surrounding the sort of 
Han Chinese and minority stereotypes. Now, I'm just I'm wondering if there's a way to actually read that more productively or watch that more productively now. That is to say that um, this film is ultimately about the relationship between love and politics. So, Thai people, they have a politics, right? That's grounded in love, it's a sort of erotic love, right? On the one side. But on the other, on the other side, there's that sort of hand demand to be loveless, as it were, or not to be caught up in the sort of uh, privatizing effect of love that you, you see, actually, that, that creates the vision. Violence, the only act of violence in the film, I think, is when two men broke out into a fight for a woman. Right? That kind of vindicates the sort of Maoist project to say, well, how can, you be, how can you really build a future society if you are so caught up in the sort of privatizing effect of love? Right? So I, I, I really wish that you know, we understand there's a problematic, maybe the director didn't really intend it to be read that way, but once we kind of set it up, like oh, there's one, one side to sort of die people, love and politics, and on the other, other hand, hunt people, love and politics. I'm just wondering if there is... Um, a way we can rethink something like that. And just to say a little bit more about what I'm saying, for example, there's very similar uh, things that's being talked about in Brown's political theory. James Baldwin and Hannah Arendt disagreed over the place of love in politics. And our, and our family said, love is, the, is apolitical and arguably the most anti-political force. It's a, it's a great question because also, but also there's something profoundly patriarchal, isn't there, about the, about the, uh, the there's also something profoundly patriarchal about the, the Dai um, 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 culture as it's being presented to us in the film. Uh, do, what, do, what, do you guys have thoughts about that? I think the, uh, I, I, I love the suggestion that how we read this Han and Dai um, difference productively, right? I mean, in the his, historical context, 1980s, um, what does it mean? And how Zhang Nanxing, the film director, of course, this is the following, this is the adaptation of a, a autobiographical fiction, right? So it was there, so, you know, it's, it's not really her filmmaker's choice. Uh, but I think, you know, that uh, there is a long history even in social China representing minority group, right? Uh, which I think is different from current Western understanding of, you know, um, uh, exoticizing the other. So there's a long history there. And then the, the, what, one of the best known, you know, socialist films like Five Golden Flowers, <laughs> also, you know, taking place in the same Yunnan, you know, province. Uh, but, but the question is, is very good, uh, but I don't have the answer to your question about love. But from a, because this is by women director and also by women writer, um, I think you, we have to understand this film, uh, Li Chun, toward the end, in a subtle way, refuses both, right? So even though, even though both the guys, you know, fighting for her, but toward the end, she said no. I think that is very, very powerful. Uh, and I also think that the difference between the, you know, ethnic groups here in this film obviously used uh, as, you know, to criticize, absolutely, the, the Cultural Revolution and then the Han, you know, like ethnic group, their particular habits, you know, um, and that was also something very hot in 1980s, right? Because in 1980s, all intellectuals, they're, you know, they're thinking about the question, why China lags behind, you know, and then they, they turn to culture, right? So 1980s, uh, China influenced by uh, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, you know, uh, 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 Gustav Jung's, you know, collective unconsciousness ar archetype, and Toynbee's, you know, civilization uh, uh, theory, so on and so forth. So 1980s also saw the rise of a psycho cultural structure away from the idea that social political changes can change people or the world, right? So they turn to the psycho-cultural aspect. Um, so this, this film definitely is both kind of a comment on that and also a refusal of that, you know, saying that, you know, social-oriented uh, activities are uh, uh, very important rather than just 
you know, thinking about Chinese culture as timeless, never changing. And that was very popular in the 1980s when people reflect why China, you know, uh, lets behind. Um, so my argument is that the difference, especially the ethnic, you know, the uh, ethnicity, ethnic difference here used as a critique of certain things in China, but then the director does not really go into to essentialize that. And she retreats and then focusing more on social relationship. Yeah. Uh, I have something very intuitive, I have to say, because I'm not a political science person. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. Because you think about cultural revolution, the kind of violence you see is class struggle, as people betray each other, families being broken. But this kind of violence as is the most violent in this film, it's actually quite powerful and liberating. It's for, it's for love. Mm -hmm. And the, the loudest part of the film is when the main, the woman, um, uh, Jie Ru, decided to go. And you have the overwhelming noise, uh, which is actually a celebration, in, in my opinion. But one is a bit reluctant to see uh, uh, Li Chun go back to the village with the father to then marry uh, Daga, right? One is reluctant to see that. Um, right. And it doesn't have to Right. Place. Yeah, yeah. But then we're talking about the, you know, the, the dichotomy of it. You have to think about, from music perspective, the composer um, composed this in 1984, he went to the conservatory in 1977 as an undergraduate, studied uh, with Du Mingxin, who wrote a cultural revolution model opera, The Red Detachment of Women. All his education was to learn how to, you know, was primarily focused on Soviet um, kind of romantic or German music. But none of that you can hear from this and from any of his compositions the moment he entered the school. And he's not alone. Now he's generation of the class 97, from 1977. All of them went back to trace or retrieve their inspiration uh, from their experience uh, spent, uh, was sent down. So Xu Xiaosong is from Guizhou, so he was sent down for four years to the, a male minority tribe. Um, you can see that. You, you don't hear any of his mm. academic uh, education, musically. <laughs> so, so I disagree that the fight between the two men is the only instance of violence, or even the greatest instance of violence in the film, because uh, I want to remind us of the weird ending, an actually quite traumatic ending, um, that doesn't even quite make sense. There's something happens, you know, because when we're at the point of the breakup, um, he is going to go, like, uh, go back to Beijing, go to college, and she's, you know, contemplating committing to the local community, and then suddenly, we find out somehow she actually is the one who left. She shows up in this modern attire. Yes. She's the one who went to college. He stayed behind and is buried along with all the Dai communities that we met in the film underneath this apocalyptic mudslide that has just erased everything we have seen. And, and then what followed is essentially the beginning of the novel Rebecca, which was enormously popular in China in the 1980s. Uh, last night I dreamt I was in Manderley. Yeah. And then so suddenly it retroactively turns everything we have seen into the film into the space of oniric fantasy, a kind of classic female fantasy, which again I think works on some level with the kind of framework of comparability where the primitive culture is locked into a, a, you know, a, a, a timeless space. Um, but you know, I'm just like, what is going on <laughs> with that mudslide? And you know, if there's, there's some form of like extreme violence enacted, but you know, at the level I think of, again, of fantasy. And then it's very interesting because it calls into question the kind of realist status of the film, which we have to this point accepted. And so thinking about that violence against, you know, maybe these sort of eruptions of romantic love in the film, I, I think would be, yeah, interesting. I can't really do justice to it. Ling Jian, how do you read the, uh, the extraordinary ending of the, of the film? Well, the autobiographical novel, the title is A Beautiful Place. Um, so it, it's it, interesting. And then the, this new uh, film title, Sacrificed Youth, I was thinking about the title. And I think the translation has some issue, right? Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. It's more like the right of youth or... A commemoration. Exactly, yeah. right? It's not sacrificed youth. There is a song about called 有一个美丽的地方 from the 50s. It's about Dai. Oh, okay. No. It has okay. anything to do but with... That, that's possible. I don't know why she used that one. Um, so I think the, 
there's a natural disaster, and in fact, Ren Jia uh, got killed before uh, she went to college, right? At least in the novel, it's, there's a chronology there. Mm -hmm. It's not that she left and then Ren Jia, you know, later, no. She, Ren Jia died first, and later on, the policy, right? The Sandown Youth policy changed, right? So most, you know, Sandown Youth returned to the city, right? Um, so that's, you know, the, the, the chronology. Um, Sorry, I forgot your question. Oh, wait, just, just how do you, I mean, why did the director make this extraordinary decision to wipe out the entire village in, in, okay. a, in, a, in a mudslide? So, so, of course, it's not the director, it's the, uh, it's the novel. Well, it's right, but I mean, story. the director made other changes and, you know, she didn't make that change. Um, I mean, right, but I think, I think the more fascinating thing is that after that, you know, natural disaster, and in distance, and then Lichun. Of course, this whole film is, you know, uh, is flashbacks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's in her memory. That's why she, Zhang Lianxin particularly used the warm color to indicate it's a memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think despite all that, in 1980s, thinking about that period could be traumatic, a cultural revolution for most Chinese people. Yeah. But then this, I think, is quite revisionist understanding of that experience. Yes. And the Rebecca, I mean, is, is a very good ex explanation. So I think we've probably got time for like one more question. Um, so, <laughs> two more? Sorry, okay, two, two, two more. I just want to say the ending was not uncommon in the 80s. A lot of fifth generation film had that kind of ending. Yellow Earth, the woman sort of mysteriously disappeared and drowned in the river, and a lot of 80s film ends like this. This is a typical what we call 80s ethnographic gate function as allegory. That reminds me how we're thinking about the hand and the die. We talk about die as if it is real ethnography. It's not. It's not real as ethnography. It's ethnographic gates. It's oh. not really, it's imaginary. That's why I think I like how uh, you talk about it. it's a documentary, but it's also subject of dreaming. Yeah. It's highly romanticized, right? It's ethnographic gates from a hand intellectual perspective, but function as allegory. Reminds me how Jameson used to make sort of Sarcastic say, oh, the third world literature is allegorical. And Richard took a bound that say, because of the Western intellectuals as the gaze, subject, oh, third world intellectual, a third world literature into mm -hmm. allegory. We can say the same thing for the Chinese intellectuals, old ethnic minority is allegory. All of them, from the socialist era to today. That's how this film functions. What we probably disagree is what is the allegorical meaning of the die? Does it represent essential feminism, sexual politics, or socialism? We disagree about what is allegory means, but they're allegorical. Mm -hmm. And that's not just John Nancy's own invention. In that sense, I agree John Nancy probably has a lot of style that's different from the male peers. But in that sense, she's in line with all the her male peers at the same time. And also the director before her, in the socialist era, ethnic gays is as the ethnographic case of a minority in China during the social cinema is also allegorical, and today too, in commercial cinema. That's the reason, that's why Richard talked about why the Marxist left intellectual fail the decolonization because of the ethnographic case is always allegorical. And that's exactly the same about Chinese cinema, why socialist cinema in sense, essentially, in a sense, failed because of the ethnographic case of the minorities. They are always allegorical. And I think this is something Zhang Nanxin did, um, Tian Zhuang Zhang did about male, male, at the same time about Mongolians, and uh, um, uh, uh, also I think um, later ones Zhang Yimou did about Yunnan too, right, as a minority, and Lu Chuan did about Tibetans. And even socialist era, the, uh, the musicals about the socialist revolution is also ethnographic gaze of a minority, in the sense allegorical. So I think this is something we put in a broader sense is, is in the sense how the left-leaning intellectual or later liberal market-leaning intellectual have the same problem, right, as ethnographic gaze. I well, is there an alternative to that? So if I every know. time... I, I, I'm talking about critical uh, of that. I'm not really proposing an alternative filmmaking. Okay, uh, Lynn, last question. No, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll let it end on that. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> I think that there is a, there is a possibility. There is right now the camera given to the to the villagers, to the ethnic minority people, right? They're their own ethnographic, own documentation. 
So I, I don't know, but uh, I just thinking the the height of actual ethnographic gains has been gone for a long time in the socialist era, this era, and today's commercial era. So. Okay. Any any last co uh, comments? Do you want to address? And otherwise, we will. Just quickly, Zhang um, Duanxing, uh, after graduating from Beijing Film Academy in 1962, stayed in Beijing Film Academy as a professor. So she taught fifth generation filmmakers. And then she also worked with sixth generation filmmakers, right? So her next film, 1990, uh, Good Morning Beijing, right? Worked with um, sixth generation uh, scriptwriter Tang Danian. And uh, the male lead is, you know, Wang Quan'an, right? But later on became a well-known sixth generation uh, filmmaker. Uh, so once again, it's like uh, her influence is great. Uh, her impact on, you know, generations filmmakers, great. Uh, but uh, her films, uh, I would say, in both Western scholarship and Chinese scholarship, very much marginalized. Uh, not many people, you know, really working on her, right? So that's, I think, the, the, the major issues, right? Um, yeah. So that's also why we, you know, we show her here. Yeah. Well, that's uh, all, all the more reason, uh, even more of an explanation as to what a, what a treat it was to see the film. So thank you, uh, thanks all, all three of you for being part of it. Thanks to everybody for coming and for staying for the conversation. And uh, let's thank our three guests. <laughs>